I'm joined now by Congressman Darren Soda, representative for Florida's 7th District and a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And I'm very pleased to recognize Congressman Soda also as one of our 2020 Medicare Advantage supporters. Congressman Soda, welcome. Thanks, Mary Beth, for having me. And thank you for your service to our country as well. Well, thank you. One of the questions that I wanna kick off our discussion with Congressman is recognizing that your district is one of the highest Medicare um, Advantage penetration rates in the country. 60% of Medicare eligible seniors in your district choose Medicare Advantage. And we've asked a similar question of your colleague, Congresswoman Terry Sewell, who also has a high penetration rate of Medicare Advantage in her district in Alabama. Why do you believe seniors in your community choose Medicare Advantage? Well, first, it's a good deal for Central Florida seniors. Uh, we know that 98% uh, of Medicare beneficiaries have access to at least uh, one uh, Medicare Advantage plan that includes vision, hearing, dental. You see it well marketed in the area when you turn on the TV during the day, and we have a, a lot of companies working on that. And, you know, there's a lot of retirees in Florida, more in South Florida, but still a, a fair amount in places in my district, uh, like in Point Siena or in uh, some of the other areas like Champions Gate and Reunion. Uh, so you combine all those factors in it. Medicare Advantage is a, is a popular ticket in Central Florida. Thank you. And as I mentioned, Congressman, you have been a true champion of Medicare Advantage and um, you, you've shown leadership, your words of support, but you've also shown it in action. Um, recently, you stood up for Medicare Advantage beneficiaries in your state, in your district, and in your country by signing on to a letter with your colleagues, um, Val Demings and Gus Bill Rackus, in a letter that was sent to HHS Secretary Javier Becerra. And we're so grateful for your support. Can you tell us why signing on to that letter was important to you? It's popular among Florida seniors and it helps to expand care. Uh, we know the savings, uh, an average of uh, $1,640 a year, 40% lower rate of cost burden. So seniors get that they are saving big dollars and cents uh, by enrolling in Medicare Advantage, including one in five seniors in Florida, which is uh, uh, pretty incredible. And so when you go around the district and you get a sense of the popularity, the amount of use of it, uh, and the fact that we're striving to expand coverage in Florida. I'm a strong supporter of the Affordable Care Act. We saw uh, after President Biden created the open enrollment, our roles went from 1.8 million to 2.3 million Floridians on the ACA after helping with the subsidies. We're fighting right now to close the Medicaid gap where nearly a million Floridians uh, fall in that gap where they're too wealthy for Medicaid and uh, they can't afford the exchanges. And of course, uh, through Medicare with uh, Medicare Advantage uh, to make sure that uh, seniors have choices in Florida. Thank you. The next question I wanted to pose to you, Carson, relates to the reconciliation process. And this is a question we've been asking all of our congressional guests, your colleagues, Congressman Guthrie and Congresswoman Sewell. And this is a question on the minds of our um, allies with the Better Medicare Alliance and with our grassroots um, advocates who are beneficiaries. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest in um, congressional work here, and there's just, you know, a question um, among our seniors on, you know, whether or not those in Medicare Advantage will be affected by the work going on right now in the reconciliation process. And, you know, if you can just share your thoughts on what's currently going on in that process, um, and, you know, if coverage, you know, in this area could be affected, um, by Medicare Advantage beneficiaries? Sure, Medicare Advantage will remain its high quality program that we have already, uh, including uh, after we pass the Build Back Better Act. Uh, no new fees or taxes, same options and quality. Uh, with regard to expanding the base Medicaid program, it is about those few seniors who 
aren't enrolled in the Medicare uh, Advantage program to have other options. So we wanna make sure we create options for everyone, um, but I suspect we'll see a still remaining strong preference for Medicare Advantage uh, in Florida, given its popularity, uh, its uh, large enrollment, and, uh, and that Florida seniors are, are pleased with the program. Well, thank you and um, appreciate it. I know it's hard to provide prognosis, but insights are so valuable um, when it's a program that our seniors care so much about. Um, shifting gears a little on an issue not directly related to Medicare Advantage, but an issue that you have shown um, a lot of leadership on, um, and this has to do with protecting seniors who are under the care of a guardian. Um, you have introduced legislation on this um, issue for the past two Congresses, and you wrote a really powerful um, op-ed in the Orlando, Orlando Sentinel um, with your colleague, Congressman Charlie Crist. You know, can you share with us and you know, with um, our audience here um, about your work in this space? We sadly had uh, a major scandal with a local garden in Orlando who was working with the courts and literally bringing people into guardianships uh, against their will or falsifying documents, uh, not holding proper account. And that was a real wake up call in Florida uh, that we need better rules of the road for guardianships. These are very important for seniors, especially when they need them, when they're no longer able to handle their affairs, but they don't have children or other family members who could handle them. Uh, so guardians play a key role, but we need to uh, have reform. And so our bill, along with Congressman Bill Arrakis, Chris and Fitzpatrick, a bipartisan bill in the House, bipartisan bill in the Senate, it's all about data collection uh, so that we can identify instances of fraud and abuse and theft, uh, as well as the positives of guardianships, and then use those to help uh, shape uh, best practices and guidelines uh, for states across the nation. Uh, so uh, data, if properly recorded, does not lie and can be helpful in crafting uh, some of these reforms, and that's what our bill is all about. Thank you. Congressman, you play a leadership role in many different um, committees and groups um, in Congress and in the House. You serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, you're um, a key um, role player in the New Democratic Coalition, and you also serve on the Problem Solvers Caucus. Looking past reconciliation and even into 2022, can you speak to what you see as priorities on the committee and in these caucuses um, as we look at the time beyond reconciliation? Sure, first off, oversight will be a big part of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, as a former chief of staff of HHS, I'm sure you're very familiar with the Energy and Commerce Committee being uh, that that's under our jurisdiction. But we have several big items we'll have to review. Uh, first of all, any changes uh, to Medicare and Medicaid, we will have many hearings on. Uh, we're also going to be looking at uh, technology changes. Uh, there have been issues with algorithms that have spread misinformation uh, through the internet, internet privacy. These are all um, bills that we'll be looking at and assessing. Consumer protection, things like autonomous vehicles and, uh, and helping out with uh, uh, making our cars safer and uh, trying to electrify our transportation system. Uh, resiliency in our utilities uh, will also be key. And returning back to the healthcare space, telehealth, uh, something that I know that you all are big supporters of. It's an amazing situation when you saw for years a big food fight over whether it was going to work or not. And suddenly with the Families First Act um, early last year, we just did it. Uh, with a waiver and uh, we saw patients like it, providers like it, insurance companies saw that there wasn't the rampant fraud that there was a concern about. And, uh, and so now we have to do the oversight and the work to see what of these professional healthcare services can be permanent, uh, probably most of them uh, and where we could expand it or where there has been issues where it's not appropriate to continue. Um, but we know COVID has been sort of the fast forward of the workforce and we know in healthcare as well in many ways. Uh, and so um, oversight will be a big part in some of these other bills that we're working on, um, but there'll be no shortage uh, in the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, given the breadth of our jurisdiction and the key issues facing our nation. 
Well, thank you. Well, Congressman, I said that we would respect your time and we know that we got you in between meetings. And I also just want to recognize the really critical committee you're on and just uh, the unique district you're in and the pressure you're under to address so many important issues. So how grateful we are for the attention and leadership that you give to the seniors um, in your district who really look to Medicare Advantage um, for um, the strengthening and protection of their health and financial security. So thank you on behalf of all the allies and um, beneficiary and advocates in the Medicare Advantage program. So thank you and, on behalf of the Better Medicare and, and thank you to all of you for providing quality Medicare Advantage coverage to uh, seniors in Florida's 9th Congressional District. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you.